Hi, this is Doc with Doc and Lefty. I'm glad you joined us today. We're here every Tuesday, not every day, but every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, we have we have a, an exciting show for you today because I have said something that has riled the Lefty up. And <laughs> that doesn't take a lot, but rile him up to the point where he's going to argue with me publicly on Facebook. Now, that's something. Hey, no, I'm just trying to make sure that everybody's aware that you're full of crap. <laughs> is that it? Well, I'm going to prove that I am not the one who is crap-filled. <laughs> <laughs> right? You are a crap-filled Twinkie. Oh, man, friend. here we go. All right. So I, how, what did you do this weekend? Anything fun? This, this past weekend, no, I didn't do uh, anything particularly fun or exciting. I had a, uh, um, a nice relaxed weekend. We're going to the see the folks. On uh, for over the weekend in Minneapolis, see my nephew. Okay, That'll good. be a good time. But last weekend, no, just sort of hung out and, and didn't do a whole lot. How about you? Man, I was packed from beginning to end. I had uh, the fights up in uh, Mason City, and I wish I could remember what the name of the uh, person's organization was. Is Chad Bergmeier. He had some terrific fighters up there. He had a couple of guys that, uh, honest, they, they would make the rock look shamed as far as being ripped out of their gourd. It was a good series of fights, but unfortunately it was a Mason City. So, And then the next day we went to, uh, um, uh, what is it in town, with Elvis and uh, – that has Elvis, Carl Perkins, somebody else. What do they call that? Oh, Clear Rock Lake? Of, what? No, not Clear Lake. What do they call that? It's not Rock of Ages. Oh, Million Dollar Quartet. Oh. And that was pretty decent. That, that was a whole lot of fun watching those guys – and the actors really got into being that that persona, and they, for the most part, sounded just like them. I thought that was pretty interesting. Hmm. So, and then uh, of course, you know, my usual, you know, saving lives, changing lives, you know, that kind of. Thing. Yeah, you no, know, it's it's an exhausting enterprise. What taking lives and saving lives, saving lives, yeah, yes, yes, it is. Unlike you know, lawyers take dimes. Yep, that's take it. Dimes. I'm just trying to make a buck. Is that, oh, is that it? See, I, thought you, were, I thought you were in for into it, into law for the ability to defend the low, the low man, the the nope. poor guy on the. Nope, I'm just in it for a buck. I mean, I did, I did spend about uh, um, oh three, three and a half hours meeting with uh, some folks at the Mitchellville prison who may be, uh, who may have experienced some sort of discrimination because of their their gen, uh, their sexual orientation, but. You know, you mainly just to make a buck. Mainly just to make a buck. Yep. Well, you know, that is a typical liberal. Here, we have to make you do charity for everybody else, but I'm in it for a buck. Nope. I, don't, I don't do any charity at all. Well, that, see, and that's, you know, interestingly enough, there's been several studies out that say Republicans, not necessarily Republicans, but conservatives, and particularly Christian conservatives, I have a tendency to be much more charitable in their giving than than those that are not conservative or not Christian or both. That's interesting because I've seen studies that say the exact opposite, but whatever. Well, you know, we'll bring that up. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll duke it out one day. Mm -hmm. So anyway, a couple of interesting things. We'll start with local politics. There's a lot of things going on nationally, something very important going on nationally currently, and very important internationally, and very important locally. So we're going to start with the local news um the iowa senate I, the iowa senate is uh you know basically dominated by democrats well i wouldn't say dominated well, they, I would. they have one seat well that's <laughs> enough for domination you know that's that's all senator palpatine needed there's only, that's what i'm saying there's only oh for really <laughs> i thought this is a serious political affair i had show. to get my nerd on just Good for Lord. a second but the bottom line is is the senate today passed a medicaid measure that I believe, and now you've been keeping up on this more than I have, but I bit. believe that it, it pretty much passed along party lines. Um, well, I didn't see the actual votes, but I'm, I think that they maybe brought. Well, you can maybe check that out while I'm talking. I'll double, I know, I'll double check. I know that uh, that there were some Republicans in the Senate that were that expressed a willingness to to cross the aisle and and vote for it. And honestly, there's Republicans in the in the House that are willing to vote for it too. What I my understanding of this whole thing is that Governor Branstead really is kind of on a hill by himself on this one. 
Um, he, you know, he's he's the rank and file folks and the Tea Party folks that are in the legislature are going to be with him. But he's sort of taken this on, and really for no reason, if you think about it, especially when you have every single healthcare lobbyist, like from Iowa Health to down to the the lowliest uh, uh, pharmacist assistant, um, going to Washington, lobbying the governor, meeting with um, Catherine Sebelius, just all about getting Medicaid expanded because they want the uh, they want the dollars, they want the funding, and they want more patients. And really, the governor's only argument, his only argument is, well, we can't trust the federal government to to fund it after the uh, the hundred after the first few years when it when it drops down to ninety percent. And I don't know. I guess if you're going to be engaging in that kind of stuff, then we should never pass any law ever. And he should make sure that he budgets out the fact that we get road money from the federal government every single year. And it just to me, it's kind of a political hill that he's he's uh, he's set up for himself and really is kind of against the the wave of popular opinion, even among members of his own party. Well, it, now I'm reading uh, an article here with the title. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the title is. Just for clarification, Iowa Senate Democrats drive toward bankruptcy with Medicaid expansion vote. It's okay. It is from. It's uh, hard to go bankrupt with more money. I don't understand yes, how that makes any sense. But, but you see, the problem is, is all right. Well, well here, the issue right now is is the vote. Mm-hmm. Vote was twenty six, twenty three along along party lines. Who abstained? Um. It doesn't say. I can't find that. I didn't read deeply enough mm-hmm. into it, but it looks pretty much like a, a party line vote. Um, one of the things that Brandstad has said several times is he hasn't been able to get any assurances from the Obama administration, and particularly from Kathleen Sebelius, that after a certain period of time that they won't continue to fund it. In other words, it's very possible that the federal government will cost shift this entire burden straight out of the state. And the Senate bill allows the governor to allows whoever's the governor at the time to opt out. So that kind of takes care of that particular concern, doesn't it? Well, you, and you know, you would think, but part of the problem is when you're dealing with politicians and, you know, I've met my share and so have you. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is, you know, what if it's a Republican? Now he's going to be accused of by the Democrats of, you know, taking a service away from the from the poor and the needy. And if it's a Democrat, suddenly everybody's taxes are going to go skyrocketing. So there's, I don't see anything good one way or another in this bill, even though it says, well, geez, we can opt out of it. How many times has the government ever opted out of, of being able to increase taxes? You know, and really that's, that's the issue that I have. You know, it's going to increase tax. That doesn't make any sense. Well, you're going to have, if the federal government backs out of this, the, the state is going to have to raise property taxes or gas taxes or whatever tax is going to be in order to cover the bill because the federal government won't be providing that money at that time. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, one of the, to the, one of the points you made, you know, a lot of people want those extra patients coming through with the extra Medicaid dollar. Mm-hmm. That's about like saying, geez, I want somebody to come through and as they take money out of my wallet, I want them to hit me in the foot with a hammer. The, the medical community is already overstressed, overburdened. Um, there's abuse of the current system of an astronomical proportion. All you got to do is sit in my office for, I don't know, a week or sit in the ER for an evening, and you'll see all kinds of abuses, all kinds of ways. And the problem is, is we haven't fixed the, the business model of medicine to the point where it can be affordable. As I have said to other people, um, you know, having a universal health care system is something that is honestly wildly popular among doctors for the simple reason that suddenly we don't have to deal with 50 insurances. Yep. It makes it simpler for everybody. It makes it simpler, but the problem is, is then who decides who gets what care? And the more removed that you are locally from your care, from your decision to care, the less likely it is you'll receive the care you and, need. And my response to that has always been people are already removed from their care. Absolutely. That's why healthcare shouldn't be a market forces entity. You know, I mean, people if you're people often equate healthcare decisions to these sorts of decisions that are common in the marketplace. Hey, I'm going to buy a Snickers bar or I'm going to buy a uh, a piece of grapefruit and we'll get into that right, right. after the break. All right, thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll be right back in a minute. 
Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Drink, dance, party. Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with Birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about Birthday Fridays at KittiesUSA.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. This is Doc, Doc and Lefty. You're listening to us on Webcast One Live.com. We are here every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Before the break, Lefty apparently had gone to the store and was using uh, grapefruit analogies and uh, squeezing onions or whatever. I was. But we were talking about health care policy. And so go ahead and continue and, your point. Well, and mark and market forces. I mean, the really big, yes. the really big deal with healthcare, and the reason why um, it's so complicated is that there are a lot of folks that are trying to make this about just sort of general market forces. Like I said, if you go to the grocery store and you buy a, you have the choice between buying grapefruit and a Snickers bar. Well, a, the normal reasonable consumer can kind of navigate that choice with relative ease. They know about the Snickers bar. They know about the grapefruit. They know about the relative nutritional value of both, or it just comes down to a a simple cost point. The Snickers bar is cheaper or the grapefruit is cheaper. I'm going to go with the, the cheaper option. Healthcare is not like that at all. The regular consumer is not educated on uh, when it comes to his or her health care because we don't really know what's we're not all doctors we have no idea what makes us sick or what makes us better in in general or in particular we know we know that maybe we don't want to be lazy uh, and uh, we want to exercise and not eat you know fatty foods that sort of thing but overall if you've got like a kidney stone you can't take care of that yourself and you certainly don't know the different procedures involved with taking care of that because you're not a you're not a licensed physician along with that what what uh, this um, economist I was talking to you over the break said was, so say that you do want to make a health care, uh, you, have, you have the sort of the, the costs in front of you, and you're going to have an MRI or nothing. And they say the MRI is it costs this much. Well, I don't have that much. Are you still going to forego the MRI, even though it could give you valuable information about what might be wrong with you? And most people are still going to have it regardless of the cost because they're talking to a doctor, and the doctor has said, they require it. I'm not saying the doctors are necessarily doing anything wrong because that's how we treat people. Yes. And, and you have to rely on a doctor's expertise. But when you have when you have when you're making those decisions, that takes it out of simple market forces. You're not talking simply cost, benefit and uh, supply and demand. You have other things on your mind aside from there because the market is ill-equipped because standard market forces are ill-equipped to deal with healthcare decisions. Honestly, that's why healthcare should have been taken away from the the private market entities a long time ago. All right. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna rebut that. I think that the private market is the only thing that can keep costs under control, and here's the reason: human behavior. Uh, the The bottom line is is you have to determine what your what your life is worth. There's several things that drive up healthcare costs. We've gone over this a hundred times. I can tell you that that doctor is going to say you need an MRI for most things, not because you really need an MRI, but because He's got to cover his rear end because he might get sued. So, you know, that's the thing I keep coming back to. There's a lot of doctors you, that would get behind universal health care if you started reforming other things. Uh, another case in point, um, I will be dealing with a, a patient in the office, and they'll have a diagnosis, let's say it's bipolar disorder or ADHD. Things that have no real, that, that don't have a physical cause, but it's a chemical cause. They'll insist, I want an MRI, I want a CAT scan. I want it. I want it for my kid. And I'll say, well, you know, they're very expensive. They won't show much. Well, I have insurance. That's the response. And the most common time you hear that response is when a person with Medicaid who isn't paying for the insurance. That's one of the problems when you start talking to economists is they start dealing with numbers. And, yeah, numbers are great, but the problem that everybody overlooks 
is the fact that there's a human component to this. Somebody who's concerned about their child, they want everything to be done. Well, fine. I will do everything I can, but getting an MRI or a CT scan isn't going to tell you one way or another, isn't going to help at all. I know doctors that, that do have a psychiatrists that have CTs and MRIs in her office, and they routinely run these kids through there. Well, mm-hmm. okay, parents want to. And that's the problem with, with the, I agree with what you say up to the private market is the only way to do that. Well, here's, because the more you provide a service that is free, the less valued it is. Here's the here's the issue that I would take with with what you said as, as far as behavior is concerned, and I do tip, I do generally agree that behavioral economics is a, it's a t- it's a tough slog with with healthcare because of, and it's pretty clear that if you have insurance, you tend to get more healthcare. Yes, I don't think there's much debate even on that necessarily. However, when it comes to a relationship between a doctor and a patient, it's similar to a relationship between an attorney and a client, and I can tell you. I can tell you, I haven't. I don't know how many times that I've had people, especially because I haven't been doing this as long as someone who's been at practicing for 25 years, how many people come to me and say, well, I think that I, this should happen because my friend's brother's lawyer got this for him. Yes. And I am constantly saying every situation is different. Every fact scenario is different. You came to me because I have specific training and experience. You have to trust my decision. And as long as that decision is reasonable, given the community of lawyers that I'm in, then I'm okay. Doctors are in the same exact position. If you have a patient that comes to you and says and demands that they want a CAT scan or an MRI, I don't think that it is outside of the purview of the doctor-client relate or the doctor-patient relationship to say, listen, I'm going to tell you my professional experience and my education dic- uh, dictate to me that this is unnecessary and it's it really won't do anything for you. And if you insist on it, then you can find another doctor who'll take that. But I'm not going to perform that for you. And if they still insist or they want to sue because you didn't do it and something happens later, you have made a reasoned medical decision that is um, supported by the community of doctors that you live in. And I, I don't th- I don't see as and this is a legal opinion almost. I don't see how malpractice can can derive from that. However, then they take it to the, the next doctor. The doctor performs it. That cost shifting might still occur or I mean, that that person is going to be going to try then do this stuff anyway. Just. Yeah. I think there are steps that a doctor needs well, to protect himself. That's all I'm saying. Well, now I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of stick lefty here because I'm gonna have my response, and then we're gonna go to a break because we're apparently having some technical technical difficulties. I I understand what 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 you're saying, Blake, but the problem is is the moment I start to say, well, I don't think an MRI is gonna be helpful, and I try to start explaining. The first thing they'll they'll do is like, well, but I read on Wikipedia or I went mm-hmm. on the internet, and I say, well, you know, that's fine, but those that is, that information is inaccurate. Next thing you know, you know, they're moving on to a different doc. Other doctors won't. I, I, honestly, uh, part of it, and this is part of the we've talked about this before. Doctors are their own worst enemy. Doctors don't want to confront you; they just want to get, help you out and let you on your way. They really don't want to stop and go. Well, you know, explain why you're not getting something. Um, the second thing is, is if they d- do decide to sue, right? Um, I can tell you, and I've seen this happen repeatedly, even because you know I'm from a family full of lawyers. I've seen this happen. Strategy my brothers have used, strategy my dad has used. Well, why didn't you get this test? This other doctor got this test, and there goes your defense. Doctors don't want to be sued. It's terribly time consuming, and a lot of times people sue you just so get you know five ten grand out of you, but yet you have to spend all that money on legal fees. So we'll be right back after the break. We'll uh, talk a little bit more specifically about Medicaid, and then we're going to move on to the Supreme Court and to Cyprus. Um, Hopefully, when we get back, we'll have this technical issue resolved. Thank you for tuning in to Doc and Lefty at webcast1live.com.
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Hi, this is Doc with Doc and Lefty. You're listening to us every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. on webcast1live.com. Before the break, I uh, was stating about, you know, Medicaid expansion, how, you know, in a perfect world it sounds good, but the imperfect world is, you know, you have to deal with human behavior, people taking advantage of things that they really don't pay for, um, you know, people misusing the, the money they get. And uh, for me, the, the other issue that we have is, there are plenty of, of places in town and across the state that provide um, health services for free. There's a place in Waukee. There's several places in Urbandale. There's several places in Des Moines. Um, there, I wish I could remember the, the Spanish one because uh, I don't speak Spanish, so I can't remember. Mm-hmm. So we do have a way of taking care of people without, without expanding Medicaid and you know, incurring the cost of, of billions of dollars, which is essentially what we'll do to try to cover 150,000 extra lives. I, it just, I, I think that it's interesting that virtually no one, virtually no one agrees with Governor Branstad on this one. Virtually nobody. You've got Jan Brewer in Arizona who's, who's going to take the funding. You've got uh, um, uh, Rick Scott down there in Florida who's very, who's a healthcare guy himself before he was, um, uh, elected to the uh, the governor's mansion, he's going to take it. Um, it just Republican governors all all over the state are are going to take this this expansion, take this money, and Brans. It just it feels like a political stunt to me. It doesn't feel very principled to me because once it, because also because uh, Brand said was sort of a Medicaid guy when he was in the the um, the office the first time around, and yep. it just it well, what's changed in twenty five years. Well, one of the one of the things that's changed is you know the the Tenth Amendment is a big deal, as you know. Uh, with it's the not a big party. deal. It's not a big deal. The Tenth Amendment is a big. It's deal. not a big deal. Not with, according with to the Supreme the, Court, it's not with the Tenth Amendment or with the Tea Party. I meant okay. the Tenth Amendment, all right? And you have to keep in mind, you know, like Jan Brewer, she came straight out and said, "Well, here's the deal: we either we go with this program or we're going to go bankrupt in Medicaid." And the same thing that uh, that Florida said. Um, one of the things that happened is the hospital signed on, uh, and so did the AMA and, mm-hmm. and several other people thinking, oh, we're going to get a much bigger piece of the pie. Well, what happened is now there's now your state can opt out of it. So, you know, in Arizona, there was a tremendous push by the hospital association, which is a powerful lobbying group, uh, to, to have Jan Brewer change your mind, as well as is in Florida. So, you know, you have that kind of kind of issue going on. Now, to kind of segue a little bit from, you know, you know we're going to hook th- our three things together. Blake, during the break, said that Brad Pitt as, well, who would you say? Oh, was? that's not, we don't need to get into that. But <laughs> you had no, said that you, you, said that you want to talk about gay marriage. <laughs> yes, up in the Supreme Court. Yeah, it started today. It did start today. People all over Facebook, uh, red and pink equals equality signs. It, you know, and I'm I'm glad, I'm happy for them. And you know, my my thing has always been, you know, it's really tough to be to deny property rights to a group of individuals. You know, it's it's just one of those things that that you can't. And you know, and you and I uh, agree on that. One of the interesting things I saw today is that 
People are outside scalping tickets to this hearing. Yeah, six, well, they do. They do that six thousand dollars a piece. You can get like seat uh, people to sit in line for you. There's an industry, but I guess apparently the big big cases in the Supreme Court. This has been an industry for a while that I'd never heard of. That you can get people to uh, people will pay you you pay people to sit in line for you so you can get into the oral arguments. And honestly, this is a big this is a big one. Um. It's uh, it's been a long time coming, and I think that the uh, the sort of the pro equality side said we are going to wait until we have so much rolling behind us, so much political will behind us that it'll be a gigantic backlash if they rule against it. Because for years, even when I was in my freshman sophomore year of college, when this first started, I me mean, in two thousand two thousand one, when this first started, kind of percolating a little bit people started coming out and people started kind of starting to talk about gay marriage as a political issue my first thought was well shoot with the kind of supreme court we have we can't bring that up it'll just get voted down five four without even a fair hearing you know thinking that how especially after bush v gore how conservative the court was well now i think that the uh the political winds have built up to such a force and the anti-equality side the the traditional marriage side is so disorganized and looks so foolish in, on their side of the debate that except that except there's rumblings that there's going to be a sort of a they're going to punt on a procedural issue and not actually get to the merits of the case um i don't well, see how they you, could vote against it well can you explain that for our audience a little bit yeah there the main there are two uh um two issues that help get you into the supreme court procedurally before any sort of arguments on the merits of your, your appeal. And one of them, I won't get into, um, into the mootness and ripeness, but I'll get into standing. Standing is a legal doctrine that says that, you know, the right people have to be there to sue. And our legal tradition says that the people that are injured or the people who have an interest, some sort of interest in the lawsuit would have to be there to sue. And there is some thinking. And from some of the questioning today, kind of tipping the hand of how they might rule that without addressing the merits of the case, the Supreme Court may say that the defendants, not the not the not the plaintiffs, and it would be the appellant appellee, but the uh, the um, the pro traditional marriage, or however you want to phrase it, the folks that are on the defendant side of this thing, don't have standing to appeal, don't have standing to participate in the appeal because they're not directly affected. It would have to be California. Because California, the state of California is the one that enacted the law, and so these these uh, these marriage groups and these religious folks, um, you know, they're not the legislature, and so that and then um, if that were to happen, then the Supreme Court would say you don't have standing, therefore we can't actually hear this case, punt it on down the road, and then somebody else would have to pick it up, but and that would overturn Prop Eight in California and California only, and that would save the Supreme Court from having to make a nationwide decision. All right. So one of the things when I ran for Congress that I kept telling everybody that wanted me to get up there and introduce the Defense of Marriage Act, I told them that I would not do that because it's a state issue. And even though the Supreme Court doesn't think that states' rights is that important, states' rights are very important. It says it's clear in the Constitution. So f for me, you know, I don't have a problem with the Supreme Court ruling, well, listen, Proposition 8 is not constitutional, period. But what happened in um, the April decision? What was it, April two thousand nine decision uh, here in a, here in Iowa that uh, yeah. basically they said DOMA is unconstitutional. Then they took the additional step and issued a statement that says therefore gay marriage is legal. Um, I, I don't I don't I think that's overstepping what what really they're they're there f to do. They're simply there to interpret whether the law is constitutional unconstitutional. They can't really make a statement and say, therefore, some other thing that isn't brought up is now legal. And, you know, that's that's one of the things that you that my brother and you agreed on is that uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, the, the court was well within its rights. So can you explain to some of our more conservative listeners that that wasn't necessarily legislating from the bench, but more issuing uh, a decision? Sure. Well, and I and I have to apologize. I I haven't read the decision in about four years. I read it when it came out, and I I remember some of the key points of it. But people that have been reading up on it more recently than me might want to call in and correct me if I get something wrong. Um, 
essentially the uh, the the plaintiffs in Barnaby Bryan tried to you know they they did the classic civil rights test where they said you know it's a, a violation of equal protection it's also a violation of our due process rights the for, um, uh, equal protection under the law and our substantive substantive due process and I won't get into what all that means necessarily but uh, um, we uh, uh, basically, essentially, those are just two legal avenues to pursue, pursue a civil rights um, issue. Mm-hmm. And I can talk more about how the Supreme Court ruled after a break if if we think that we want to maybe start from sure. start from the top. So we'll start from the top right after the break. You're listening to Doc and Lefty on Webcast One Live dot com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back in about three minutes. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna to wanna to know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I wanna find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not gonna to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me, but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after 
the technicians are there, they're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It was great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do, I mean, fixed rider, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. Hi, this is Doc with Doc and Lefty. You're listening to us every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. on webcast1live.com. Take a brief break here just for a second. I want to say happy birthday to Robert Edgington, uh, one of my high school classmates, along with Lucy Kiever, uh, who is a friend of mine, and uh, I'm glad both of you are doing well. Um, Kelly Shaw also has a, a birthday today, but we're just Facebook buddies, but I figured I'd do a shout-out. Before the break, we were talking about um, the Defensive Marriage Act and the decision in here in Iowa um, that, uh, you know, essentially cleared the way for, um, you know, civil uh, marital unions between uh, same-sex couples. And one of the issues is, is, and this is, you know, the Christian issue, the Bible clearly states in the Old Testament that you're supposed to throw those that lie with a man as a woman or lies with a woman as a man, that kind of thing, out of your camp and stone them to death. One of the things I point out is to, to the Christians, and they, they don't like this, and trust me, I'm a Christian. I believe 100% in God, 100%. I believe in Christ, the Virgin Mary, since I'm Catholic. But really the problem comes down to the Old Testament clearly states what you can do and what you can't do. If you have a gay son, you must toss him out of your camp. You can't welcome him back into your home. But it doesn't mean you can't hire a, a gay decorator. It doesn't mean that you can't drive on a road built by a gay man. Or it doesn't mean any of that. What it means is you have to keep your house in order. You have to keep your people in line. But if you're living with a bunch of other people that don't believe in you, that don't believe in Christ and don't believe in God, then there are exceptions to that rule. You know, if you look at it, it's a very practical, I mean, God's a very practical person from my perspective. He's not going to do anything that's going to, to set you up for harm. So that's, an, that's one of the issues I have. The second issue, and I think you and I both agree on this, if the Republicans hadn't been so insistent on having a Defense of Marriage Act, they wouldn't have had the decision that cleared the way for, you know, uh, gay marriage. So from my perspective, you know, I, I think that trying to, to fight, legislate marriage and morality in this particular case is not going to uh, lead any, isn't going to lead to what you want. Um, like Blake was describing before the break, um, you know, there's several reasons uh, why the Defense of Marriage Act was struck down. We'll, we'll start back again with that from the kind of the top, well, explaining what was going on. Well, the, it, essentially the, the court did all kinds of things, um, said all kinds of things about it, and I actually pulled up the decision because I also found, I think, where you are getting your idea about this, this legislation from the bench, and I'll address that in a second. But the, the, uh, the plaintiffs in Varnum, and, and Varnaby Ryan wanted to sort of get the, the best kind of scrutiny they could possibly get, which is... Um, uh, compelling, uh, compelling interest, the heightened, like the highest level of scrutiny you could have. And to do that on an equal protection analysis is to define a specific protected class, sort of like race, gender, um, uh, ethnicity, that sort of thing. And the court declined to, to sort of give it that sort of highest level of scrutiny and instead said, look, we, we're not going to carve out an actual um, protected class of, of homosexual people here because the county hasn't given us any good reason why we should not or why gay people should not be able to get married. They're just they're, it doesn't even pass the rational basis, which is the lowest level, the rational basis test. And in the uh, the conclusion, I'll read the uh, a little bit of the, the remedy here from the decision. Um, 
And this is what uh, what Justice Katie speaking on behalf of a, of a uni- United Supreme Court said. Iowa Code Section 595.2 is unconstitutional because the county has been unable to identify a constitutionally adequate justification for excluding plaintiffs from the institution of civil marriage. A new distinction based on sexual orientation would be equally suspect and difficult to square with the fundamental principles of equal protection embodied in our Constitution. He's not making a special exception for gay people. Right there, he's saying this. This record, our independent research, and the appropriate equal protection analysis do not suggest existence of a justification for such a legislative classification that substantially furthers any governmental objection obje- objective. Consequently, the language in Iowa Code Section 595.2 limiting civil marriage to a man and a woman must be stricken from the statute, and the remaining statutory language must be interpreted and applied in a manner allowing gay and lesbian people full access to the institution of civil marriage. I think that's. I think if you're saying that that was creating a new law, that's a misunderstanding of how that actually reads. What that is saying is. The the particular provision, 595.2, and I've read it, and that's basically just one sentence. Men, women, that's it. That's it, paraphrasing that one single sentence. That's struck so that the language then that would refer back to that statute has to be interpreted in such a way as if that had never existed. That's what they're saying. They're not creating a new law. They're not sitting there with their pens and writing 595.2 and scribbling that in and saying and changing it to make it consistent with their, with what they're saying. They're saying that that is unconstitutional, should not have been um, enacted. Therefore, the rest of the law that refers back to it has to be interpreted as if that never existed. And that's the difference. Uh, I all right. Well, I'm glad for that clarification because you know it's the way the way I read it. You know, it really didn't state that suddenly gays could get married, but it made it much more difficult to enforce the man-woman uh, marital compact, period. Well, and, and, and of course I, I don't talk, know what you mean by that, but... Well, you know, it, it makes it, you know, it, it makes it much... The the people that give the, the uh, licenses out now don't have a direction because their law essentially refers back to a sentence that shouldn't exist. Well, now it's subject to interpretation up to any, every county and everything else. Well, no, so, because if if I if I was if I have a um, a boyfriend and we want to get married and we go to I don't know, let's say Plymouth County, where I'm from originally, a very conservative county, very conservative part of the state. We go to Plymouth County, and the county recorder refuses to give us a marriage license so that we can go get married. That that's like that she can't or he can't. That's not that's not allowed. We could sue and win because. Um, marriage is uh, marriage is recognized for all people, not just one man and one woman. That's so, direction enough. So where is that recognized, though? What do you mean? I mean, I when this is what I don't understand. I'll freely admit I don't understand why striking that one line suddenly makes it so okay. that men and women can marry each other. Okay, so the 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 code section itself said that. Only, that the only marriage is recognized in the state of Iowa would be between one man and one woman. If you think about it in contractual terms, they're saying we will, uh, we're going to make a deal with you, folks. We, the state, will give you a marriage license as long as the people requesting it are male and female. Okay, and that's the only time we'll issue one. So unless, so if you're, you know, two men, we won't give it to you. We won't issue it to you. That's what. That's that practice is what has been um, labeled as unconstitutional. So you scratch that off. You don't make the distinction where the only marriages that will be recognized between one man and one woman. Now, you know, two men and two women can get married. Then you can go in and get a, and get a uh, marriage license that reflects that. So in other words, when we go back, see, and this is where, it, you know, so now I get it. So since you can't really restrict it, now you can have a marriage between two consenting adults because, as you've said before, children can't in, enter into a contract. Yep. Animals can't enter into a contract. And, you know, people that are in, infirm in some way, mentally mentally incompetent. Who don't or, understand the ramifications of marriage. There you go. That's right. So we'll be back right after this quick break. We're going to talk about Cyprus and why you shouldn't let socialists run your economy. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance. 
chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Drink, dance, party. Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with Birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about Birthday Fridays at KittiesUSA.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. This is Doc, Doc and Lefty. Thank you for tuning in. Now for our most exciting segment, the one in which probably will come to blows, at least on Lefty's side. There was big news this week because the European Union, see, we the problem is, is over here in America, we have a tendency just to fi- fixate just on our problems and not understanding that we're still a large, fro- uh, large frog in a big pond, right? That what we do ripples around this pond. So we have a tendency to be very egocentric mm-hmm. and cultural. Uh, Ethnocentric. Centric. Ethnocentric, yeah. thanks. You're welcome. And one of the things that, it's been, that continues to go on is country after country after country part of the union, that are part of the European Union has been facing financial collapse. And short of Germany injecting billions and billions of dollars into these countries, they would collapse. Case in point this week is, or just at the end of last week and the beginning of this week, is Cyprus. Now, Cyprus is a small economy. It basically makes most of its money through the banking industry. They're kind of, uh, I don't know, if, back in the day it used to, be the, it used to be Switzerland for us, then it became the Cayman Islands. But basically a place where, you know, if you're trying to dodge paying the tax, man, that's where you drop your money. Well, I think their economy is somewhere around four billion a year. It's not very big. It's, it's not very big. They it's also do a lot of for, tourism too, though. They do a lot of tourism, but it's an island for Christ's sake. It's like uh, you know Hawaii, you know, except you know no, not as many palm trees. Or Hawaii. I've never been. Have you been to Cyprus? I've never been to Cyprus. I have several friends of mine that go, and I see a lot of pictures. Mm-hmm. It looks it looks a lot like Greece, the Cypriots, right? Right. That's right. So um, what happened is they actually went and said, listen, we're, we're going to need a bailout. We've been lumping along. We're the, one of the last countries standing, but we just can't do it anymore. So the, the European Union and the Banking Commission, there's two guys that, that basically run the, that are run the administrative part of it, and I can't tell you the names off the top of my head. Banking guys said, great, we'll bail you out, but – you're going to have to compensate anywhere between 25 to 40 percent of anybody who's got money in your bank. And Cyprus went, what? <laughs> and then the the guy running Cyprus went, dude, we got to shut down the banks. <laughs> so they shut down the banks until they could work out a deal because suddenly they went from having something like close to 19 billion in investments to like in 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 short of four hours to have an 18 billion in investments. So they lost a billion dollars in less than less yep. than half a day and they shut the banks down. So then they negotiated with the European Union. And what they came up with is essentially, well, you know what? You know, if you're just a regular investor and don't have I think they said uh, it's like 100,000 euro or something. 100,000 like euro, about 150,000 in cash in there. If you have that or under, then, you know, no big deal. You know, the penalty won't be too bad. You know, 2 to 4%. Everybody can afford that. But if you're one of the Russian oligarchs that has a tendency to drop four or 500 million in there, <laughs> we're going to get those. Like, so the Russian. Russia- like 25%. It was some really, really high number. Well, it was between, initially, it was between 25 and 40%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nuts. So, I mean, this is obviously directed straight at the Russians straight at them. But the problem is you're catching a lot of Cypriot businessmen. Yep. A lot of them who are going like, oh, hold on, why am I even putting my money back in my business now? Yep. So they've come up with an agreement that if you're under 100 euro, 100,000 euro, it's not going to really be 
you know, dinged all that much. But if you're a foreign investor, no matter how much you have, it's I think it's they settled on 25%. I can't remember the exact number, but you, but guess what a bank levy did. Just guess. What did the bank levy do, Blake? Created a run of the banks. Created a run of the banks. Pulled all the money to get it down to the, to get it down to that level like every reasonable person would do and it's just it's just it show it goes to show once more that this this economic crisis that we and the British started back in 07 has just it the 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 end is not yet near it's not we haven't played it out all the way we've recovered but it's still we're still feeling effects even in these these smaller countries that we don't think about well that's absolutely true now I am going to take issue that you know it was um, that it was us and the British and nobody else. It was us, the British, the Germans, the French, the Chinese, the Ukrainians, the Russians. Part of the problem is, and this is universal, land prices skyrocketed because American banks had such low interest. Most of the land purchases in the world, over 50%, were financed in some way through American, British, and German banks. Um, And so when, when the market collapsed, Suddenly, everybody said, "Well, we want it paid for our money." Well, if you if your the the value of your land drops by half, and you have let's say it cost a hundred thousand, and you put forty thousand of your own money in there and borrowed sixty, you're still short ten thousand yep. dollars. You even if you sell it, you still owe another ten grand. Multiply that by a multi million dollar property. So that that's initially what shook everything. Then everybody the credit dried up. People, the banks demand honestly. Banks demanded unreasonable things from from their the people that they loaned to. It complete. It just it was, it was absolutely ridiculous. And if, if you if you think about it, if this had happened in the twenties, if this had happened in the in the nineteen tens, we wouldn't have J P Morgan Chase anymore. I mean, we we have J P Morgan himself, I guess, but yes, we wouldn't true. we wouldn't have we wouldn't have Citibank. We wouldn't have U S Bank because a guy like Teddy Roosevelt would have come in and bust them all up. They're lucky that we don't have that sort of trust busting anti monopoly anger really in the electorate anymore. I mean, we yeah. we kind of did the Tea Party and Occupy, two sides of pretty much the same sort of disillusioned coin. Talked about it a little bit. But there's no taste in the American public for true, all-out, just throttle the guys that did it. Absolutely, and, and part of that, part of that is is um, you know the media's fault. I mean, they yes. can report it, absolutely. But you know when they're trying to keep the people calm. And the second thing is, you had this doctrine: oh, they're too big to fail. What's going to happen? Well, you know, millions of small businesses got hit and out of work, and they saved Chrysler and GM. Well, they, even if you believe President Obama, and I don't, that he saved or created 3 million jobs or 5 million jobs, he didn't. But let's say it did. He did, but go on. The, <laughs> the bottom line is he lost 14 to 15 million jobs easy with all these small businesses going out. You mean, you mean Bush did? Well, you know, if you, if you, well, part of, but you see, the problem is, is, Everybody in Washington is to blame for this. Yes. No, and I, and I was is. Being, I was being cute. I wasn't meaning to get into a big partisan thing here because I mean it's it started back in the uh um it started back in the 70s where Jimmy Carter said there needs to be a priority on home ownership, yeah. which is a great principle. Stabilizes communities, single family dwellings are much more valuable and and have a have a more positive effect than multifamily dwellings do. Then in the eighties and the early, the eighties and nineties, the put the the fifteen year push towards repealing some of the protections that investment banks and re, and uh, retail banks had from each other, with culminating in Glass Steel getting repealed in the nineties, yes, with good old Robert Rubin and uh, and and Bill Clinton, then George Bush pushing all every sort of uh, uh, tax credit you could find towards buying up all this property and helping uh, folks even re- deregulate it even more. It all contributed, and here's the and here's the issue. And I think this is what we're we're seeing a lot. You know why this all happened? Because everybody who was in charge of the money had some connection to some bank. Robert Rubin, yes. Paul Volcker, yep. Larry Summers, Tim Geithner, yep. 
Um, and then the, and those are all the, I don't pay attention to Republican politics very much. But uh, and uh, uh, what's his, what's this guy, the bald guy for for George Bush? Carl Rove. No, his his Treasury. Oh yeah, fella. I I can't remember. Hank Paulson. Hank Paulson. That's all right. all of these guys had some connection to some corporate investment bank, whether it be Goldman Sachs, whether it be J.P. Morgan, any of these any of these firms. And you wonder why they were pushing to help deregulate the markets. Absolutely. And you wonder. Well, and see, and that's part of the problem overseas in Cyprus is when you, because it's the same the world over. You know, the guy that runs the banks for the EU is involved in a lot of these boards. The people that run the banks in Cyprus are involved in a lot of these boards that help regulate, deregulate, hide whatever you want to do. Yep. But the bottom line is, is Cyprus, unless they had that bailout, wasn't going to really exist as an economic country anymore. And it's still, I mean, and it's still divided. It's still, it's still not even politically its own country. Not really. No, not really. Yeah, it is. It's split quite a bit. And the, the, you know, the bottom line is, is, you know, here it is thumb in the nose, the Europeans thumbing their nose at the Russians taking the Russians money. And Putin says something very ominous. Russia can withstand a billion dollar loss. We can withstand a $10 billion loss. But I doubt Europe can withstand an energy loss of corresponding proportion. Oh, that you know what? You know? Here's the thing about that. First of all, Vladimir Putin will say whatever he needs to to get himself on the cover of the next tranking bear weekly that he wants to be on shirtless. <laughs> he, this guy, this guy is a basically he's full of it. If he thinks that his country, held together by duct tape and nails, can res, can res, uh, get past a $10 billion loss, he's absolutely insane. No amount of... Na- and also, so so fine, they've got a natural... He, he wants to turn off the spigot natural to the natural gas and just use it for himself. That's his threat, right? First of all, most of that natural gas goes to customers that aren't really in the wider EU. England, Germany, France, all those folks, yeah, they'll get a little bit, but he's mainly hurting the Ukraine, Latvia, all the, you know, all those folks closer to him in the satellite well, countries. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm, you know, you're not right about that. He turned off the gas about three years ago, and Europe had a very cold winter. They, uh, that's one of the reasons why Europeans are now drilling like mad off the, off the, off the, uh, in the Bering Sea and the North Sea. They're also. Um, buying billions and billions of tons uh, of oil and uh, or barrels of oil and also millions of metric tons of natural gas from everywhere but Russia. The problem is Russia cuts it off to Ukraine. Ukraine is the only spigot that Russia has to Europe. And what they do is they accuse the Ukrainians of stealing it. That way they're not to blame. But that's what he's done before. He's done it several times over the course of the years, and you and, know and that, there, that's a big that's a big risk. It, well, it, it's 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 a risk. But if he if he if he is so uh, um, completely unreasonable and dries up his own demand, then he can sit on that natural gas and eat it for breakfast if he wants to. You well, know, and that and that's true. And what he does is he ships it then to South Africa and, and China and Iran and everybody else. Yeah. yeah. So. Yep. But, you know, the, the bottom line is, is you got a lot of bad things. This, I believe this sets a bad precedent in Cyprus. Well, you know, if you want help from a government, we're going to confiscate your wages. We're going to yep. confiscate your savings. We're going to confiscate a lot of things. I think that's just a terrible precedent to set, and I think it's a terrible idea for Cyprus to go along with it. You know, I understand their position, but, but come on, you know, you're not even going to be a sovereign state after this. It's interesting that they would even suggest it, given the fact that, it is a more conservative government that proposed it. You well, know, they, they, the a more conservative government asked for it. Uh, I'm, more, I'm just, I'm just saying like, I don't, the democratic rallies who's in power right now because the, the communists screwed, you know, just didn't do anything over the last five years. And I'm wondering why they would even go so far as to talk about huge bank levies on, on citizens. It doesn't I mean it, it must be, so bad, or they're all in the pay of these uh, these Russian oligarchs, like pretty much everybody in Cyprus is. For the, they, they're the biggest. They the two the two big investments that the Cypriot Cypriot government uses and the Cypriot banks use Russian investment and Greek bonds. Those yeah. are like the two biggest ones. Well, I think they. I think 
you know, the, the communists, you know, ran it, ruined it. Um, before that, you had socialists who ran it and made it bad. And now you have a group of conservatives going like, you know, we're going to need some help. And I think what that happened is they went to them and expected kind of like a bailout from, you know, some austerity measures, you know, kind of like a bailout with Greece or Italy. Mm -hmm. And what they wound up with is a big stick in the eye going like, well, listen, we don't like the Russians. Bap. So I want to make that the final word. Left, do you got anything? Uh, nope. All right. We'll see you everybody next week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be here webcast1live.com. You can also find us on YouTube at Doc and Lefty. Um, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Love these guys. Get over here. Get over here. Love both of them.